Uh, each of us will introduce ourselves and we'll say a, a, a couple of things, but most importantly, we want to hear what you have to say. So maybe Leah. Yeah. Good morning. Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, it was kind of nice to visit with some of you. Uh, um, students from Skyview, how cool is that? Um, anyways, uh, um, I'm a state representative and we just formed, uh, reorganized, or whatever you call it. We're all sworn at on this week and uh, <laughs> um, it's, uh, it was pretty exciting. We have a lot of new members in the Minnesota House and, uh, and uh, we happen to be in a majority, which is nice. We've been in a minority for a little while and quite honestly, it's not as much fun. To be in the minority, I mean, uh, I, th I think I was pretty successful in the minority, but it's, it is a lot more fun and we can do uh, a lot of different things and exciting things from Minnesota. So I'm not going to talk about that. What committees? Want to say what committees? Oh, committees? Um, but I'm on six committees. So uh, um, I'm on higher ed, I'm on uh, government operations, I'm on ways and means, I'm on uh, rules. Oh, and then I'm chair of legacy, but I think another committee of that, too, so. Anyways, it's pretty exciting time, so I'm going to be a little busy. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon, good morning. My name is Peter Fisher. I represent uh, the area of Maplewood that's right around here, going up into White Bear Lake. I represent the southern part of White Bear Lake, and also the communities of Montevideo, Birchwood, and Willerney. I want to say thank you to everyone for being here. It's great to see some folks out here on a, a cold morning. Uh, currently on the, in the state capitol, I represent uh, several different committees. First of all, I'm on the Health and Human Services Committee, that's a policy committee. I'm on the Housing Finance Policy. I'm on the Environmental Natural Resource Finance Committee, and then I am chair of the subcommittee on water. And then I also serve on a legislative commission. I serve on the Legislative Water Commission. Mm -hmm. Hi, good morning. Thank you all for being here. Uh, it starts to actually feel a little like January finally, right? Um, although I saw some pictures, like they're looking for snow in Virginia, and yet we don't have any. What is with that? That's pretty strange. Um, so, uh, Senate District. And then also South Oakdale, Landfall, and the city of Woodbury. Um, I'm halfway through my second term, so six years, and uh, really excited to be getting back to work. And um, it's really interesting, you know, uh, with the new Walls administration and with the, so many new faces and voices over in the House, there's a real shot of energy going through the Capitol right now that's pretty exciting. So um, I think people are feeling pretty optimistic that, you know, it sort of changes the conversations a little bit, which means, you know, I think that increases our chances of being able to, to get some stuff done. Um, in terms of committees, um, my list has stayed pretty stable. Uh, I am on the education, so it's E12, Early Childhood through 12th Grade uh, Education Committee, Finance and Policy. We actually merged those this year in the Senate. That was one change that happened for us. Um, and I'm on transportation, again, still. And uh, in the Senate, we have state government, finance and policy, and elections. That's all one committee. So we get to cover some pretty interesting topics in that one as well. And I'm looking forward to a great conversation today. And hi, uh, my name is Tu Zhang. I'm a state representative for 53A, uh, the A side of Susan Kent's uh, Senate District. And uh, I'm uh, filling in the seat for uh, the great representative Joanne Ward. And so uh, the committees I'm on is uh, taxes. I'll be in higher ed with Lily. Awesome. Uh, property taxes and local government and so great yeah and, and you were just on the other side of those <laughs> that was my chair right a month there. ago <laughs> that's awesome which is part of why you got put on the yeah. taxes yeah. and as the state senator my district includes uh, parts of maplewood and all of north st paul parts of oakdale and then into white bear lake matamidi Bellarney, and birchwood uh, I'm the ranking member, meaning I'm in the minority, uh, for Education E12 Policy and Finance, serving with uh, Senator Kent. I'm also a member of the Bonding or the Capital Investment Committee, which invests in infrastructure, a variety of uh, projects affecting all of Minnesota, and also a member of the Local Government Committee, working with various issues that uh, impact uh, local governments. So I do a lot of work with the local officials on that. And I'm also a member of the Water Commission with 
Representative Fisher, uh, I'm the chair of that actually for the State Senate. It's a bipartisan group and we have a number of recommendations on, on water policy that the legislature will be considering. Just very briefly, you know that our number one priority this session is to adopt a budget. It will be about $50 billion for two years. Any number of subjects, <coughs> the biggest part of that budget is education and then we'll see help in human services number of other issues though as well, transportation which is so important, uh, corrections and we have not decided anything at this point. The whole uh, budget will be laid out, uh, there will be a proposal by uh, Governor Walls February 19 where he'll share that, we'll have the update on the budget forecast and there will be hearings in the House and Senate to determine what that ultimate budget hopefully have that all resolved, we better by May 20. And there will not be a shutdown. I promise you that. Uh, we will figure it out. So that's kind of where we're at. Nothing's been decided. We want to hear you know, your concerns, your priorities. And what we found to be perhaps the most effective is uh, if we go around and you know, state, if you want to say who you are, where you're from, and maybe you know, share an opinion on something or a question, and then after we've uh, heard from everyone, we'll uh, react to different points and have a chance for some uh, discussion. And if there's a point that we need additional follow-up or you'd like to do it uh, personally, that's fine too, just let us know on that. Um, Senator Kent and I have to leave by about 11.30 for uh, a function at the Senate uh, our caucus is involved in right now, but uh, some of the other reps might be able to be here if necessary. So with that uh, background, uh, maybe we could start with uh, Mr. Fent. Well, good morning. Um, thank you for being here. My name is Dennis Fent. Um, I'm a resident of Oakdale and have been for decades and decades. Um, my wife and I are both retired teachers, so when you, you know, why am I here? Probably first and foremost, education. Um, to me, it's the most important thing in the world. I was down to see some of you on Tuesday because I know there were there was talk of gun legislation, and um, nothing is more important than keeping our schools safe. And I don't have the answers how to do it all, but I look for you people to find those answers because it's terribly, terribly important. So, that's me. Thank you. Uh, Sharf Rainey, I'm from Woodbury. I lived there 25 years or so. Yeah, when it was just old Woodbury. Now it's all the way over almost to Afton. So it's a much bigger district at this point. Um, I'm in A, so two is my rep and Susan is my senator. And I've been involved, but you never can learn too much. Any particular issue? Question? Um, not yet. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Jodell Miller. I live in Senate District 53 on the B side. Um, I'm here to find out what the legislative priorities are. Um, I care a lot about water and education. Thanks. Hello, I'm Riley Gilman. I'm here from Skyview Middle School. Last year, my group did a project on counselors per student ratio. And Minnesota has the second worst ratio from counselors to students out of all the states. and. I was wondering if how high that priority is. Great question. I'm Lillian Bodak. I'm also from Skyview Middle School. I'm also a part of Project Citizen, and last year my group focused on waste in the school district. And I was wondering how high that is on your list also, and cutting in and managing waste for our state. I am Kathy Morgan, I'm a teacher of these very impressive youngsters at Skyview Middle School. I actually live in Stillwater, but have taught in 622 for 16, 17 years now. And when we heard that this was happening, leading into our project, Citizen um, Project, 
I just thought it would be a really good opportunity for them to see, see you all in action and have a chance to have their questions answered. Um, Nancy Livingston, I serve on the District 622 School Board, which is called and Hopedale. I've uh, been on the board since 2000, so I'm kind of a veteran grandmother on the board. But, uh, um, I, and I was retired for a bit, and now I work for Senator Weger as his legislator assistant. So, uh, and our, I have to say, our new <coughs> education commissioner is a former middle school teacher, and uh, she taught for 10 years in um, St. Paul schools. So she came in to talk to uh, members uh, uh, about uh, her education priorities and talked a lot about the middle school experience as being something that needs um, attention, you know, and uh, so I, I'm excited about, about that, that thought that, uh, um, you know, elementary school students get a lot of support, and then, and then, and then all of a sudden you're in middle school, and maybe they're not getting the support. I don't know. It'll be a good conversation, so thanks, thanks for keeping it. I'm Roy Gilman, partner of Riley. Um, been in the same neighborhood residence for the last 30 years pretty involved in the community. We have three older siblings of Riley's all went through the school district schools, several different locations obviously. Um, so we're, we're pretty concerned about safety issues, just education in general. We have been extremely happy with the district though. I think they've got a very good education. They're all going through college right now. They have those tuitions to worry about. <laughs> um, been in uh, law enforcement for over 30 years, so safety is Thank you. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, my name is Vivian Latimer Tannehill, and I am a uh, resident of Woodbury, and I am Senate District 53B, and I have concerns about taxes and tax conformity. I'm dreading going through and having to redo my taxes twice this year without knowing where the legislature is on that and where it is on the priority list. I'd also like to know um, a little bit more about the plans for taxing Social Security or not. And that's it. Thank you. I'm Candy Marcus from Maplewood, and um, my biggest concern is always health care um, as well as education. Um, the other thing that I'm curious about is in the past several years, there's been big omnibus bills at the end of the year, and it's such a big conglomeration, people don't necessarily know everything that's in it, and I'm hoping that there's ways of shrinking those down so that bills really do represent one thing and people know what's happening. That would be a whole lot easier for citizens, and I've got to believe for legislators as well. Hi, my name's Linda Stanton. I live in Woodbury. Um, I'm concerned about the um, proposed legalization of marijuana. Can you hear me? Yep. Um, and just what the study, what the studies have shown is that in Colorado, the money that's brought in by it is not enough to cover the cost of the services needed, such as calls to poison control. They've also found that there's um, an increased high school dropout rate, so it's had a very bad impact on youth even though it's a legalization for adults. So I'm very concerned that that's, there's a lot of big money pushing this next trillion dollar industry. I just think it would be the wrong thing to do. And my other concern is the um, Medicare buy-in, um, with the Minnesota care buy-in rather, is that I just don't think it's sustainable spending because that would be a spending program. You don't know how much people are gonna use that and the pr what the state pays the providers, which is the other half of our health care system, that's who's providing the services for people. So they're, they're not reimbursing at a rate that's affordable. So it's re there really has to be another solution. It's really not any more sustainable than reinsurance to, to have that buy-in. Dallas. Uh, Dallas Pearson. Uh, obviously I'm videoing it. And if you want to look, be able to watch the video, it'll be on youtube.com slash northstaroasis. Uh, I posed most of my questions in the last one, but uh, the one that I'll add, and that is uh, on water. Uh, we're all urban core, uh, so the issues for water here are a little different. 
than the rural, and rural suffers a lot because of a lot of the regulations that are put in because of the urban core needs and end up getting applied to them as well. So there, there needs to be differences there because the, the needs for agriculture, one of our biggest uh, economic drivers in Minnesota. Uh, so what, what, what are we doing to try and accommodate the needs for farmers? Well, I think we have about six topics, and if there's time, we'll have a chance to add some additional uh, commentary. Uh, I think what we'll do is, uh, first, education may have been mentioned the most, and in some various aspects on education, uh, counselors, and just the fundamental expectation of safety in every school building. So I'll uh, mention as uh, the uh, minority lead for education that it is personally my highest priority uh, that students are our future our future uh, job force uh, our democracy depends on it our economic security and you have a constitutional right to an education and that said we need to invest to make sure that we continue to provide for the world's best workforce that's what we put in state law as to what our expectation is that students are ready for college, career, post-secondary uh, you know, path could, could be to the military and we have a number of programs as you go into that for what we'll be looking at uh, over 18 billion of our approximately 50 billion dollar budget goes towards schools it all goes into a formula and various programs. Uh, additionally, there's federal money. And so I'll look at additional funding that goes into the formula. And uh, it, we can get more information to you as to what it might mean. Uh, the amount will be determined based on uh, how much we're going to have in each of our target areas. But I'll go for additional money in the formula. A second area is for special education. Every student has a right through federal law. Since 1975, I believe it was, when President Ford signed the uh, Individuals Disability Education Act. It's very important that uh, every student get that opportunity, uh, regardless of what their uh, developmental challenge might be. And uh, it costs more, in most cases, to meet that challenge. Uh, federal government has not met that expectation of the 40% partnership and so it's meant school district budgets have been stressed by having to take some of the money from the general fund to help the subsidize the special ed. Uh, every school district, including you know, right here in 622, Woodbury and you know, have said, please provide additional funds for special ed so we can meet that challenge and so I will uh, working on that as well. It's a matter of additional money as well. There are going to be some reforms, hopefully agreed to, uh, addressing just paperwork and regulation. Yes, there should be a strong accountability plan developed with the, the parent and the, you know, the teacher, and you know that's a right. But in terms of the amount of paperwork that's required right now, most everyone agrees we need to have less and streamline that. So there will be a number of proposals, hopefully reach, reach a bipartisan agreement on the special ed. Uh, just uh, on school safety is so important. You have to have a fundamental expectation that you're safe when you go to school. And uh, we uh, had a bill that you know, have various you know, pieces of legislation addressing that. Uh, to me, it's so important to have more counselors can't be a champion for preparing that we'll talk more about that, but more school counselors that can identify uh, maybe a, a student needs help or they're, they're a loner or they just need some additional help, they're not getting that attention that they need. So you know, for school safety, more mental health personnel that can help just you know, for students in coping. Uh, the challenges are just getting greater. Uh, and the Republican majority had just announced mental health and, and the, uh, the Senate had announced addressing mental health needs is very important. And so for me in the schools and addressing the school 
violence issue. It's getting at that, that issue. Uh, you know, we just had that chilling reminder of what can happen in a school at North High. Saw you know the uh, lockdown that occurred. I don't know about the individuals or what all happened, but I do know there will be more lockdowns in the future, and we can never have a ceasefire on our attempt to get this resolved and as uh, efficiently as we can. So I'll be supporting additional legislation, not only for you know, mental health but for uh, facilities improvements uh, that are needed and. Uh, there will be a lot of bipartisan work, but then it's going to be how much additional can we do. Uh, there's additional things that we can be doing, too, in terms of, uh, but I'll have my colleagues perhaps address that on education. Uh, I do want to just put in the one plug, too, for uh, early education and the importance of having students ready for K. And if you can be in a high-quality program, they're volunteer. But if you can be in a high-quality program, your chances of being able to read in third grade, your chances of graduating and being ready for the next step are so much better if you have that high-quality opportunity early on. So there'll be uh, you know, opportunities for us to expand on that. For, so for education, those are a few points I'd like to make. And we'll maybe go to a house member next and then back forth. I just throw some out, and then you guys can jump on. Yeah. And I and I'll see, uh, yeah. But we'll, we'll so, stay in the education area. Yeah, so on uh, education, last, I, I don't serve on the committee, but uh, Peter and I, uh, when we were in the, you know, the House members, we voted uh, you know, to pass some education stuff. It was in the, that great big bill. Who's, who mentioned the great big bill um, that uh, got vetoed? But it was, I, I had a copy when I was for my debate here. Um, it was literally this thick and uh, of all sorts of things and and honestly a lot of stuff that was good in there and one of them was school safety and, uh, and we we all uh, uh, voted to to uh, um, you know for that part of it certainly for school safety and it's you know it's such a real problem you know with uh, you know you just mentioned what happened in North High and the center or uh, the new governor Walls was talking about when he was a kid growing up in Nebraska they used to go to we were at a thing yesterday for water and out DNR and he was saying, yeah, we used to go to football practice and all. Everybody would come to football practice, throw their guns in their locker and, uh, you know, hunt rifles or whatever and then uh, go, go, to, go to practice and then go, go out and hunt or whatever it was. But it's such a different world and, uh, and we're trying to figure that all out and uh, the house is well positioned to do that. I'm pretty excited about, it's not K-12, but I'm going to be on higher and I asked to be on it and I just really think it's, really important work at that end of the spectrum too and it's not just colleges and uh, uh, um, in the traditional sense you know we all I think we're kind of like I remember my grandpa at my uncle's house saying Leon you're going to college you know and that's not necessarily the conversation we all need to have today I mean trades are honorable works and uh, and uh, you know certainly law enforcement is amazing uh, and of course that's college educated but it's uh, you know there's other other work that is uh, needed and wonderful but uh, you know uh, three M's of the world we need to make sure that we're meeting the, today's workforce going forward we've made some investment in capital investment all of us have voted on uh, uh, some investments over at Century College and the Fab Lab and other things and uh, that was the other sixth committee I forgot to mention I'm on with Senator Leader in the house but uh, no anyways I don't, I don't need to talk so long but it's uh, we're all really fired up and our, our caucus is definitely, there. you know, the leaders met together. Um, I'm sorry, I'll just keep talking for a second. But uh, Gazelka and Hortman were both, were the same classmate as me and uh, um, they're friends, you know, but they, I think there's a lot of stuff that they really agree on and, and they're gonna take that stuff up right away. And uh, I'm pretty excited about the status. Yeah, it's gonna get a little messy at the end, maybe as it always does. And, you know, the, after the financial report comes out and, you know, what you're going to do with money. But there's stuff that we agree on, like opioids, you know, protection of the seniors and um, and certainly the school safety. So, I'll show you. Um, so, yeah, when people ever ask me, why did you run for office? It was largely because of education. I think it is fundamentally the most important thing we can do as a state, not only for our kids and their future. And I'm a proud mother of a senior now. It's hard to believe. I did very high school. Um, 
but for our workforce and for our state's economic vitality. You know, plenty of people have pointed out, you know, people don't move to Minnesota for the weather, but um, uh, we do have an incredibly highly skilled workforce that has made us competitively successful um, in this country for decades. And we can't lose that. I mean, that, that is that's so um, intrinsic to our success as a state. Uh, we still have a lot of work to do. It's not perfect, but you know, we need to make sure we can protect that. Um, real quickly, to step back a little bit on this budget conversation for uh, for everything, but particularly in the context of education, everybody talks about you know we oh we got this surplus. Well, part of that surplus is because um, we didn't get that bill passed last year that had spending in it. So there's a little bit that's sort of left over, and you can't like just run with that. I don't like to use sort of like household finance analogies for government finance because it, it falls apart pretty quickly, but in this way I think it makes sense. If you think about a job and you get your base salary, but maybe you get some commission or you get some bonuses or something like that, you plan your basic household expenses on your base salary and you use those added extra bonuses kind of stuff for socking it away for savings or a home improvement project or take a nice trip that year or something. Um, you don't go out and buy a new car based on a bonus this year that you might not get next year, right? So that's where we are with our budget right now. Um, we have, people are still sort of crunching the numbers and we will get updated numbers in February, but when people say we have a billion and a half surplus, about a billion of that is one-time money. That's like the bonus money. You can't go out and hire people this year for that money and then not have resources available next year for them to be there. Um, so the, the amount that we have for ongoing for increases in our school formula or special education or health and human services or anything is, is pretty contained. And when you look in the future years, it actually goes down. So it's a, it's a concern. Um, so for people to act like, oh, we've got all this money lying around, that's not a realistic characterization of the situation we're in. We do have a surplus. It's a good thing, but we need to be thinking forward about it. Um, which brings me to the point about the question that Riley has about counselors, and thank you for bringing that up. When I first got elected, one of the things that really struck me was this problem with Minnesota and the fact that we rank, as you say, toward the bottom. I'm seeing the fourth and second from the last, whatever, different, it moves around a little bit. <clears throat> but um, it's unacceptable, and it's not just the high school counselor that everybody talks about in the counselors, but it's it's a whole group called the Student Support Services. So it's counselors, it's school psychologists, it's social workers, it's nurses, and it's chemical dependency counselors. And I was really proud, finally, after a few years, a couple years ago, to pass, um, it's a matching grant program, um, and it's a multiple year matching grant program um, that allowed some of our districts to hire some more of those people. So the state would put in half the money and then the district would put in the other half of the money for new positions in this world because we know it's so important that we do that. I would love to do some more of that. And the way it is structured, because it's a, it is a finite number of years that we do that matching grant, it's enough years to be an incentive for school districts to participate, um, as opposed to just here we're gonna give you money once and for one year hiring and you're done. This is a multiple year program. Um, but it's a good use of one-year money, so I'm hoping that's something we can work on. And the other thing I would say relative to the topic of school safety, um, just when people talk about, oh yeah, we're doing stuff for school safety, we're doing stuff for our students' mental health, there's a, a thing in law called the Safe Schools Levy. And it's giving funds to districts and then they get the flexibility to spend it a, a bunch of different ways and there's a big list in statute of the different ways they can spend it. A lot of that is facilities as it should be, right? I mean, it's making sure you have a secure entrance or um, uh, you know, how the doors lock and if you need communication systems within the school so that the, the, the staff can communicate with each other in, a, in, a, in a, an emergency situation. Those are all leg very legitimate ways to use it. There's also, you could use it for counselors and psychologists and those people. You can also use it for um, school resource officers, you know, when you have law enforcement liaisons in the schools, another good use. But again, that's a one-time fund. And so, and I've, I've started pulling the numbers, I haven't crunched them completely, but a, in the past, a very tiny fraction of that money ever gets spent on people. Most of that money is spent on facilities. Understand, my point is, we need to make sure that whatever we do is supporting our schools and safety and our students in all aspects. And that includes the professionals who will be there to help them. 
and if someone's in crisis or if there's something going on, if you need to get student support in a lot of different ways, that we've made those resources available. So when you hear school safety, make sure you're understanding what it is people mean when they talk about how we're going to keep our schools safe. And because there's there's multiple ways we need to address that, not just facilities. So. I'd like to welcome our additional attendees and everybody. Uh, some of you are back from the earlier meeting we had. Wonderful. But if you'd like to just briefly introduce yourself and if there's a particular issue, we are, we're just uh, finishing some comments on education. We have four other topics we're going to react to and have some additional discussion. But uh, briefly, if you'd like to. Hi, uh, I am Ann Brewer, uh, of the Dem. Uh, I am a Century alumni and a current uh, human services major at Metropolitan State University. Um, I'm an intern at Century Colleges Resource and Support Center. I am Michelle Jersak. I'm a counselor at uh, Century College and faculty member, and I oversee the Resource and Support Center. I am also here about affordable housing. It's become quite an issue. And in Ramsey County, I'm working with the Coalition and the Wilder Foundation to pass Home for All's legislation. And um, one of the quotes in there, and I'll give Leon a copy, I know I gave everybody else a copy, um, is that in the last 10 years, homelessness in our K-12 suburban, so this is including um, St. Paul, Ramsey counties, um, went from less than 200 to 800, so it's quadrupled in the last 10 years. And as a counselor, it's really hard to, to s students have a hard time learning if they don't know where they're gonna be sleeping and if they don't feel safe. So that's my number one issue this year. I have a guest with me, my daughter, she's 10. When I was younger, my dad brought me every place to, to learn about the political system and things like that. And so I'm doing the same, and hopefully one day she'll thank me for it. <laughs> <laughs> You're in fifth grade at Matoska? Yeah. Okay. A little shy. Yeah. And she's a Girl Scout, too. So we are. Um, I love Girl Scouts because it does get girls involved. In your show, so. yeah. Welcome. Uh, Jeff Moore, uh, I'm invited to the South by Trying to get involved, so let's do an introduction with that. <laughs> Great. Uh, we're going to uh, hear from Representative Fisher and Representative Jean, uh, maybe uh, about a minute or so on education. And then uh, we uh, don't necessarily all have to talk then for some of the other subjects, but uh, just to cue it up, we're looking at water, tax conformity, marijuana, health care, and housing. So, okay. Uh, very quickly on uh, education, one of the things I want people to keep in mind on is society is very different today than it was a number of years ago. And as a result, we have to look at our education system differently. An uh, example I'll use is uh, my father, uh, who was born in the uh, late 20s, uh, when he went to school, he never finished kindergarten. Because back at that time, kindergarten was not considered important. I don't think anybody today would ever argue that. I think that's one of the things that we have to think about. As we're thinking about early childhood, the needs of society are demanding more things to be done and expecting our kids to know more. So we have to start thinking about the education system differently. Likewise, as we start thinking about the other end, you know, originally, you know, they figured just a high school education was all you needed to be successful. And many people never completed high school and were able to be successful. Today, that's a rarity to be able to do that. And as a result, we need to be making sure that we're keeping affordable the higher education options, not just in the four-year degree or two-year degree, but the trade school areas where we've got the great shortages. And that's one of the errors that we've kind of had over the last few years is we've kind of lost funneling kids, making them aware of the different options, and making sure we're making kids aware of all options, not a few <coughs> options, as they continue on in their education and starting out their careers. And um, I'm also on the higher education and one of the things I'm looking forward to working on is some of the career pathways uh, legislation that can you know help our young folks or people that are re-entering the workforce or shifting industries to get some training to to have the skills that can help prepare them to enter the workforce and get a good paying job. Uh, we were at the One Minnesota conference uh, earlier this week, and you know they they project, projected that in 2030 there's going to be a shortage of workforce, and so uh, I think preparing our community for uh, the upcoming uh, you know decades that are ahead of us, and so having giving people the skills to, to enter the workforce and to find the jobs that can help uh, them make a good living. And 
keep our state prosperous. Uh, two other subjects to the single subject rule, which was brought up, and then waste reduction and what can be done. Um, on water, uh, Representative Fisher, you're the chair of the new water uh, subcommittee. Right. Uh, this is something new that's in the House. We've never done this before, is having just one committee to address water issues. And a lot of what we're going to be doing is kind of building off of the Legislative Water Commission that both Senator Weir and I are on. Uh, we're going to be dealing with policies coming through there. And there's a couple of things that we're looking at uh, is number one is that uh, over the last few years since we've had the Legislative Water Commission, we found out very strongly this is not a Republican versus Democratic issue. Uh, there's a lot of agreement across the aisle that we want to make sure that we're protecting our water for the future. Uh, we're, very, we're all very cognizant, whether it's uh, my colleagues who are in rural Minnesota or somebody that's locally, is that typically whatever ends up in the water, somebody else is drinking it. And it's just a matter of time when it gets there. The example being is in southeast Minnesota, if something ends up in the water, say if a manure pit breaks open and leaks through, that could be in somebody's drinking water within 24 to 72 hours. That's because of the different geology. In this area region, depending what aquifer you're in, it may be 20 to 50 years that before you see it, or it could be thousands of years before it makes its way in. Northern Minnesota and Central Sands areas is a little different, and so we have to take a look at the geology that's involved with it. And as a result, the other thing that comes in is the regulations that go with it. We want to make sure that we're protecting waters, but we're also making sure that we're giving the opportunity for our businesses out there. And one of the things I'm real proud to say of is that I've worked closely with my uh, counterpart on the Republican side of the House to move some things forward. Uh, one of the things that has made some people on my side very uncomfortable is the uh, legislative bill that would address the regulation. It's called uh, uh, John Stein's letter of what the process is going to be to make sure that businesses hey, are... John Stein, the Pollution Control, Control Agency. Agency. From uh, uh, right, and he's from Maplewood. Uh, is uh, making it clear so businesses know what is the process they have to go through, uh, what to expect when in terms of regulation field. The other area uh, that we've worked very hard on, we're going to bring that bill back because it failed in Omnibus Prime. Uh, and I've had, well, there are people on my side who are uncomfortable with it and pushing it out to it. It's going to be a bill that I'll be working with the other side to bring back across. But the reason it also gets very complicated on the regulations, as I mentioned earlier, water flows very differently. And as a result, when they set regulations, they have to make sure that they're protecting the water quality, not just when it's flowing normally, but it would, when it's very low flow. And an example of a, a business thing that was just in the papers, as you may have heard in Southwest Minnesota, a company called Shrimp. True Shrimp was to, uh, was went over to South Dakota because they said the private laboratory process was too slow for them here in the state. Uh, and one of the problems that they were facing is that for the shrimp, you need salt water. And when you discharge salt water you know, at a high flow time, you know, it may be okay, but what they have to take a look is the low flow time because the waters they're discharging into are also used by agriculture. And if you've got too much salt in the water going through at a low flow time, all of a sudden you, which is when they're going to be pumping for irrigation at low flow times, all of a sudden the water going out is too salty, which will not only impede the crop growth, but eventually the soil becomes too salty and no longer will grow crops. And that is the balance that we have out there, is trying to figure out how do we do it. So as a result, some of these things get a little bit more complicated. In our state, we've been extremely protective of our waters here to keep them clean. One of the things you're hearing a lot about, the chlorides that are ending up in our water, people saying we need to do more about that. And this is one of the consequences. You see that as a result, while the company knew what was expected of them, it, they felt it wasn't moving quick enough, and so they went to another state where they don't have the same high water quality standards that we do. Peter, I believe, is the most knowledgeable person on water issues in the legislature. And uh, I, I, his father is, was a hydrologist, and Army we're Army. just you know, very pleased that uh, he's become a leader in that as a public policy. So we'll be working a lot more. The recommendations that we have on water policy are listed on the uh, website for the Legislative Water Commission. I think my newsletter. I know some of you get it. We just restated the uh, recommendations we have for water. Can I just yes. say two yeah. quick sentences? Yes. Um, especially as you look down through our district into Woodbury and Oakdale, um, we're dealing with the 3M water settlement and we had legislation last year. It's very important that that settlement stays in the East Metro. We don't want any of our non-East Metro colleagues eyeballing that money as if they can use it for something else. 
it's for our it is for our water, and so um, and we created a system uh, process for oversight. So we're doing things to make sure that that is going to be administered, and we're continuing to work with our locals um, and local community members and pay attention to the process to make sure that that process is working. Concern was expressed understandably about the simple subject rule and the nearly 1,000 page bill that was vetoed and uh, hopefully that will never ever happen again and the representative young just fresh off the campaign uh, and you know new to the legislature maybe you'd like to offer your thoughts on that and uh, yeah. maybe we're all tracking that yeah and so you know we were doing uh, new member orientation speaking with uh, speaker hortman the leader of our state legislature she, she talked to us about you know what what rules we can put in place to make sure that we don't stay past midnight, that we get the work done in a timely manner, but yet allowing uh, residents and the people of Minnesota to come in here and to have transparency on our bills. And uh, Representative Louie is a veteran, and he could probably speak more to uh, the legislative process itself and some of the community structure that we're, we're putting in place. And you have a house uh, reform? And he's a chair, so I think he can <laughs> well, you know, it's funny, when I first, very first got in the legislature, my very first vote, I think, was related, you know, years ago, it was a single subject issue that um, the conceal and carry had passed, became law, but it was in a big bill, and someone sued on this, and so we had to vote again because it was determined by the courts that it was illegal. And it that was in a bill on circus? So, yeah, so it was like, and, it, and that was actually really pretty small. And quite honestly, uh, we both have done this. Both parties have done this. And we're not, as Dems, we're not innocent. Uh, the Republicans did it this time. But we had a bill that, uh, during my tenure, it's called the 1812 bill. And Lyndon Carlson was the author of that bill. And that was, uh, it was, you know, a big bill with all sorts of stuff thrown in there. And part of the problem is, honestly, for us, because, uh, like, I, someone brought up the school safety, and we talked about that, but that was, you get these big bills, and it's really hard to, you know, to vote against some of them, because there's so many good, good things, and then there's so much, I don't want to use the word, but not so good stuff. <laughs> you know? So, you know, so the, anyways, that's the problem, and I, I'm of the belief that, uh, and I'm pretty excited to be on the rules committee, but, uh, um, you know, we were guilty, so I, I appreciate that. I think our leaders have uh, and stepped up, and I believe the uh, Gazelka, that's one of the things they've talked about, uh, the leader of the Senate with uh, Leader Horfman, and uh, and I think there is going to be a major effort to try to, to eliminate that. And there, a lot of it's not uh, necessarily evil. Um, sometimes it's the push of the time of the clock, you know, so we all do that. You know, you might cut corners when you're doing a home drive. You know, you bring up your home stuff, but you might cut corners, you know, to, or drive fast to get somewhere. Sorry, <laughs> but, you know, so that's kind of what it is in that nature. It's not necessarily, you know, I think this big bill had some bad stuff in it. It was political to try to get us to vote, you know, to make us look bad. So there was some political reasons, but there is a commitment. I'm sorry to talk long around this. No. Super fascinating issue, though, because we all, you know, there's a variety of reasons, strategic, why that might happen, but. I think there is a commitment to, to, to try to eliminate that, that process. And half a sentence on this one, because Candy made the right point. It's not about us, really. I mean, it's about it's about the ability, and uh, Representative Jean's point about you know making sure the debates aren't into the middle of the night and that kind of stuff. Transparency. Making sure that the public has an opportunity to know what is going on in the legislature, that we can represent you. And, you know, Anytime you've got three people in a room making the final decision, <laughs> None of us are in that room, right? So that means none of you are represented in that room. And that's why it's so important that we get back to the processes and the rules. Okay, on tax conformity, it's our expectation that all Minnesotans will be able to decide whether or not they want to do a standard deduction, which is you know, doubled at the federal level now through the uh, federal law change. And if you want to do the the standard deduction, or if you want to itemize, it's up to you. Uh, the uh, Minnesota Revenue Department has issued a ruling to that effect, and that's when hopefully you'll be able to do your federal taxes at the end of the month. And, and I'm not quite sure the federal uh, shutdown, uh, how that's going to fully play out. No one, no 
goes for sure, but uh, conformity, the uh, ability for you to decide either way, it's not, you're not going to be tied in necessarily to doing a standard deduction. If you want to itemize, you can go ahead. Uh, in terms of the overall tax policy, that's what's going to be rolling out over the next 110 days, whether it's uh, further further addressing uh, Social Security, and you know, part, part of it is not taxed, but if you wanted to uh, expand that further, it'll all be a part of the discussion, and that goes for all the tax policy that we're going to have. Uh, can I, can I yes. bring up another little thing on that issue? Um, at this time of year, all of the various caucus leaders go on different panels and talk about these issues, so um, several of us saw last night on Almanac. Um, and Tom Bach has done this in a couple of different forms, and he makes a really, really, really good point. Um, the federal tax bill did not help Minnesotans on average. Um, and so part of our challenge as we do tax conformity is to make sure that we don't do it in a way that exacerbates those exact same um, you know, penalties to Minnesotans. And so, you know, we're going to, that, and I really appreciate him saying that because it's about. Minnesota working people and you know middle income people making sure that that, that you know we're held harmless as they say that we don't pay a penalty because of that. So I appreciate that emphasis. One item I believe that the, the leaders of the legislature and they kind of put forward you know the process in terms of what's going to be heard in the order. And uh, I believe marijuana was discussed last night and that was brought up that. So, um, I, and I've, I've got to sit on one of these leader panels one time when this came up too, and I think it's been pretty interesting because I think there's a pretty consistent view um, that two things. Minnesotans want us to at least address it. You know, this is something that Minnesotans are talking about. There are a lot of people who believe we need to go ahead and do this legalization, and as our elected, as elected representatives, we're listening to them and we're hearing that. On the other hand, a lot of states are embarking on this venture and learning a lot. And Linda, you brought up some great points. Um, you know, I want to look at, that's the thing, we need to look at this research. It's a complicated issue. There is taxing, there is public safety, there is, um, uh, there's all sorts of quality control issues around it, you know, and so, and like, different states allow individuals to grow a certain amount themselves or not, and how much, and like, California's having all sorts of, I read an article in the New York Times the other day that was really fascinating because I happened to tour the Leaf Line facility, which is the medical cannabis down in Cottage Grove just a couple weeks ago. Oh my gosh, you really have to go take a shower after you are in there because the, the smell of that plant is so <laughs> overwhelming. And, um, and so people in California, where there are now marijuana legal farms, Neighbors are all up in arms because it's like their their neighborhood stinks, you know. So I mean, who who'd have thought, you know? But these are the kinds of things that, as we're looking at this, we need to be learning from what's going on. Bottom line, it is a complex issue. There are no easy answers here. How we do it, um, and we have to be um, aware of what it does to our medical process, etc. So anything that complicated isn't happening. Like you know, but I do think we owe it to Minnesotans to respond to their interest that we have the conversation and we really dive into these issues and understand them. And what I expect will be, will be we'll get at least done in this session is probably a task force or a report, a whole report on uh, medical, medical marijuana, uh, recreational marijuana, some reports from other states uh, like in Colorado or so. Probably more study. Yeah, yeah. More, study. Yep. A more comprehensive study. On waste reduction in the school, uh, it's very important. And what I would suggest is, you know, you know, a school board member here at Nancy Livingston, but you know, at your own school at Skyview, ask them what's being done at that school in terms of you know, reduction, recovery, you know, recycling, and and then with the school district, they can have policies. I know there's economic incentives that can be done. Um, fully encourage that be in our own state capitol building, but that would be the short answer. See what program you can do right there, starting in your classrooms, in your school, and then present it to the school board. And to the extent there's a policy, uh, we do have uh, goals and statute regarding that now, but we'd be happy to you know, talk And what on. items does the school or the school district purchases? Like, can it be recyclable? Yep. Uh, 
Uh, we do. We certainly do that for the city in terms of what we buy uh, for our city. The state's really moved on that. It's fascinating. It's hard to. I don't know if you guys you got all those uh, like the waste barrels. It's almost hard sometimes to figure out. You're like, <laughs> I don't know, maybe yeah, not for you young folks, but for me, I'm like, okay, but you know, what's every cycle? Anyways, if we, the state's really doing a good job, and there's a bit of shaming too if you ask for like paper, which causes some battle, you know, with the northern folks because they're uh, they're farming trees, you know, they're uh, so we have a, it's an interesting state, so they want us to print stuff out and then. Uh, <laughs> Sometimes uh, our caucus, if you ask for some a copy, if people look at it, you're like, you know, you know, like you're wasting. So it's fascinating. Just quickly, do you find it? Most of your households, the majority of the stuff is recycled now. Yeah, that there's more in recycling. I mean, it's changing, but we have to keep working on that. I read a great article yesterday. You were talking about some articles you read on marijuana, but the, the 3M is uh, every product. Their, their employees yeah. are being challenged to to meet sustainability goals. So every single, even chemists, my son's at PhD, you know, he's a chemist at 3M, and even they, you know, every every department is, uh, every product is supposed to meet sustainability goals. And I think as a state, we can learn from uh, industry there. I mean, it's it's quite a challenge when you think about big, your husband works there, but uh, just how big that company, I was trying to read it, it was like a 200 page report, but I couldn't through but I was reading it last night and I fell asleep. Anyways, <laughs> it was good, but not. Magic <laughs> <laughs> school. Sorry. Think globally, not yeah. globally. Um, Peter, uh, maybe you could take us into housing and healthcare. Okay, um, housing. I'll be very quick on because uh, I'm seeing we're almost at 11:30 here. Is we do have a housing crisis that's occurring. Uh, by and large, a lot of the folks who are homeless have got kids and they are working jobs. The jobs just don't pay enough. The other thing complicating it is that we've got a lot of loss of affordable and low-income housing because a lot of those units are being turned or converted into high, uh, high rent situations. But as that is occurring, nothing is being done to replace the units. So they are disappearing quicker than they're being put in. So we have to take a look at a combination of, of uh, one-time funding to help address uh, building and also policies. And then uh, very quickly on the uh, healthcare situation, uh, uh, we were, uh, some people were mentioning about the Minnesota Care Buy-In. Uh, what that is being looked at is very similar to a uh, uh, option that people would have the ability to go into. They would still pay their fair share of the housing costs, but, or of the insurance costs, but from what we've looked at in the past, it ends up being about 20 to 30 percent less, lot because of the administrative costs that go into it. Uh, the, uh, Medicare system that we have or the Minnesota buy system that we have here operates with uh, a lot less overhead than they do in industry. In the private industry they operate with about 20% overhead and the local government units about 3%. So that's one of the reasons that we're looking at and that's one of the things that our small businesses in the area, that's the number one thing that they're always asking me about is what they can do to have a, a, a Medicare type system or at least being able to have the option to consider buying into the Minnesota care system and then paying their share of the costs that are supposed to go with it. And in some regions of the state, you really only have one option, and so this would at least provide some competition. Great. And prescription drugs. Uh, anyone with concerns or family that yeah. not a not where it's a, uh, yeah. outrageous and it's outrageous, and I believe <coughs> President Trump just offered some additional you know, concerns on the subject, and uh, I don't know if it's, it, I always hear, well, it, it's the bully pulpit that we have to use, even in the state, uh, you know, no one seems to disagree with the need to, you know, lower, you know, the price, which, and, uh, you know, I've seen, you know, families that, you know, have to make choices between groceries, and whether they take the full amount of pills they should be taking, mm -hmm. uh, I, I just find it so totally unacceptable, and I feel very frustrated that it still has that. Remember when former Senator Wellstone used to take people to Canada in the bus mm -hmm. to get, uh, it used to, to work with some, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, the new but, attorney generals. But, uh, and the, the, and the attorney general, uh, Keith Ellison, has talked about it, other attorney generals, but that is clearly on our <coughs> radar and uh, you know, we passed you know, some legislation in a bipartisan way uh, 
Dr. Scott Jensen, I want to do a shout out for him, yeah. who a Republican senator from, is it Morno or? Chas or Chas Chan 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 yeah. And uh, you know, he has just made this a crusade, and so you'll see a, a great deal of work on that. Uh, but you know, it's government just saying, you know, we, we've got to put some additional caps on this. So add that to the health care debate yeah. as well. So those are many of the items that were addressed in uh, Michelle. Well, you, you just sparked an idea in my mind is that um, there's the, the pharmaceutical piece, but uh, as a counselor, I've been working a lot with mindfulness, and I'm getting my certification in yoga so I can help my students. And well, research is showing that mindfulness techniques very often for me um, issues are actually more effective than drugs. Um, and so a couple of uh, seeds to plant is that could there be legislation that supports K through 12? I know she's had yoga since kindergarten, since preschool, you know. Um, so some of the mindfulness that helps prevent some of the issues. Um, and the other piece I didn't get to say last time is uh, for higher ed. Um, with affordable housing, a lot of the community and technical college, just we do not have housing on campus. When we talk to our uh, sister institutions who have housing, that's a part of their solution. So maybe, and I know it's a huge ask, but start thinking about how can some of our local colleges build housing because um, if we had family housing and couples housing as well as single housing, then we can work within our system, I think, a little bit more productively to uh, make sure that at least when they're a student that they have a pillow that they can see. Great, and uh, we'll get to that. I, when it's, the Senator Kent is one of our experts on transportation, transit, and she's been a lead on that. Just very briefly, very briefly. Um, everybody knows it's a priority. Um, it's our roads and bridges, it's transit, it's all of it. Um, and uh, uh, we are, we, as Representative Zhang said, we saw this fact, the, the, the number about um, the sh workforce shortage is over 200,000. We will be short, uh, 200, more than 200,000 people to fill the jobs that we need to do around the state. So we need to attract people here, we need to keep people here. And when you look at the younger generation, they want transit, right? And it was funny, um, Governor Walls the other night told a story about having gone to like a distillery business up in northwestern Minnesota who really wants transit in the metro because his sales are here mm -hmm. and transit helps his sales. Right, so you know, it's 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 understanding how interconnected we are. Right, exactly. That is the ultimate one Minnesota sort of thing. And um, and 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 we all work together, as he as he says, when Rondo does well, the range does well. You know, what could be better? And so we need to make these investments. We need to have the conversations about how and where the money comes from. Um, and I am excited that we have people who are really committed to making these investments that are going to have tremendous returns for us in the future. Thanks. One more question or um, comment. Um, I, I'm just curious if, if there's plans to do work with hiring managers who have a disconnect because we're, we're really looking at a skills shortage, not necessarily a people shortage. And every hiring manager that I've ever worked with wanted the person with the highest credentials they could possibly get, but they were hiring for jobs that really didn't need those. So, so as you're talking about these different avenues to your degrees and things. What are you doing to work with the business community to help them understand that they're shooting for the stars when they really should be looking at the horizon? That is such a great point. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. And the business community is involved uh, with workforce councils, and there's workforce councils you know, throughout the state. Uh, and, uh, and so I would just say, you know, take a look at that. Uh, but the business is at the table. We were just over at Century College with the president and a number of people. They have a very active group of the business community working with them. Uh, so, and, and I understand that the business community is there, but is it the right people at the table? Yeah. Because yeah. it's not the person who is at the top of HR that's attending these meetings. Yes. It's the hiring manager that's hiring yes. for the position. That is such a great point, Vivian, and please let's follow up about this one, because I would love to dig into that. All right, thanks. Yeah. Good. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think you have our contact information. If anyone needs to uh, get a hold of us, we all have newsletters, etc. if you want to get on that as well. And uh, again, on uh, behalf of all of us, thank you for being here today. Thank you. And if you wouldn't mind, and you're willing to be in a photo, uh, 